Good afternoon and welcome to our second In Conversation with HWP. These webinars were introduced at your recommendation and again at the conclusion of the webinar we welcome your feedback. One of the bits of feedback we also were asked to do is could we talk about individual funds. As each portfolio is unique, we're not going to because they may not be relevant to everybody and so I think that's important. I'm going to start with a general advice warning, as usual. The information contained in this webinar has been provided as general advice only. The contents have been prepared without taking into account your objectives, financial situation or needs. You should, before you make any decision regarding any information strategies or products mentioned in this webinar, consult your advisor to consider whether that is appropriate having regard to these objectives, financial situation and needs. You've heard us talk a number of times that the market fell in the first quarter of 2020 on the back of the virus. It rose in the second quarter on the back of the virus and better news and was very much mixed in the third quarter reflecting the mixed views on the outlook for the virus and actually it's been as we've entered the fourth quarter in the US it's been negative on the back of the virus as well. Capital economics put this succinctly and they, as they said, while we continue to forecast that equity markets will make further ground in the next few years, the rapid increase in COVID-19 cases in Europe poses a downside risk to their projections. So if equities continue to sell off, it will be because the virus has staged this second wave, which we're starting to see, especially in the UK, is getting publicity, um, and towards the worst end of fears. If bonds sell off, that's going to be because the virus, for some reason, comes swiftly under control. So people become optimistic, they sell off, and that brings us to the issue of vaccines. And a vaccine does provide hope. And while a positive outlook remains for a vaccine, this is going to provide a positive tone for risk-based assets, whilst there is this consideration of a vaccine out there. And uh, you know, we are optimistic. You know, we are not experts in this case, but one will be delivered you know, at least by the middle of next year. Um, and that would there, that's going to provide, as the news of this comes out, upside in risk-based assets. We also have to look at the US election, especially with um, what's happened with coronavirus and, the, and uh, the US president. It does raise uncertainties, which markets dislike. Um, while we'd argue the world can't afford another four years of Donald Trump, the policies of Biden are unfriendly to markets, and you must take that into account. Markets will sell off if it's considered more likely that he'll win. And it's been quite interesting since the weekend talking to fund managers, the number of global fund managers that are starting, starting to talk to us about the Democrats even gaining ground in the Senate and getting control of the Senate. Um, that the Republicans had been um, forecast to hold. If that is the case, um, it, there is no blockage to, the, to especially the tax cuts. And the other thing that the markets are are worried about are the antitrust laws and therefore the breaking up of things like Facebook, etc. Um, and you know, we're not getting into debate on the good or bad of, the, of these tech stocks, but the breaking up is considered a negative. Um, so that is, has come more into play. Capital economics actually only yesterday came out and supported this view. They said to, just yesterday they felt that Joe Biden could be bad for stock market returns. And they also see the outperformance of big uh, tech stocks coming to an end. So. It's just that this, this doubt um, that we're seeing. I actually believe though, that if long, medium term, the Democrats coming in is actually a positive for markets. So you will see them sell off at the beginning. But in the medium term, why I think they're a positive is the degree of stimulus you will see from the Democrats versus the Republicans, it's going to be actually at, at a multiple and the stimulus has to be a positive. So whilst markets could sell off in the short term, I think medium term, it's a positive. You look at PMIs, they suggest that production continued to rebound in September, but at a lower pace than earlier in the quarter. So the big picture is that the state of recovery in manufacturing is unlikely to be a good guide to the broader economic recovery in coming months. I think the reason of this is where COVID-19 has hit, um, especially businesses, it's in the services sector. It's in things like hospitality. Um, they're the areas that have been hardest hit with the pandemic and will be the hardest to hit if there are a second round of restrictions as we go into the northern winter. The colossal levels of government stimulus that have been pumped into economies, they, it makes it very difficult to determine their true state. And we believe, believe therefore, whilst we look at asset allocation, and Kane will talk about this further, 
um, we're taking a really prudent approach um, and we think that's the way to remain for the foreseeable future. The stimulus that central banks have rolled out globally comes with a cost for the future. And I th I, there was a figure that Heptagon Capital in London printed uh, at the beginning of uh, October, which really took me by surprise. The US budget deficit has grown by 200%. So everyone, I don't know if you remember when it was at 4.9% and Peter Costello always talks about 3% being this golden level, but it's blown out to 15.1% of GDP. So US authorities have adopted a do what it takes approach as has Australia after our budget on Tuesday, which Ian will talk about in, uh, shortly as well. So you've got ballooning debt levels, inflation expectations are being debated. Uh, this has been amplified by the US Federal Reserve itself. So the Fed as it's called dumped its 2% inflation target in favor of an average um, target of 2% over time. So what happens it's in the future it's going to allow inflation to run above its stated goal of two percent for some time so this new policy is adopted by the fed the annual symposium at jackson hole where every year it hosts the the central bank of policymakers academics and economists from around the world and that's where they pulled that so i'm going to just hand over to kane barano to talk about asset allocation and uh, i'll come back shortly thanks will so Risk-based asset volatility at the speed that we're currently experiencing means the tactical positioning, it's difficult. But that being said, we do believe that equity markets, they, we believe that they did not present long-term value back in March, especially when balancing for the risks that were apparent at the time. As investing is a patience game, asset allocation has mainly been looking at tactical tilts on the margin towards areas that have stood out for being undervalued, such as emerging market equities or areas that look oversold, such as A rates. Due to the defensive nature of the underlying assets and the difficulty in replicating them, long-term opportunities in areas such as infrastructure have also appeared. Now, I'll, I'll hand over to John Green to talk about fixed income and currency. Thanks, Kane. Um... Look, the reality is it's been a reasonably choppy month for the bond market, or sorry, quarter for the for the bond market. But as we get to the end of the quarter, the actual yields of bonds in both the US and Australia have barely moved from where they were at the start of the quarter, which which belies the amount of activity that there was um, throughout throughout that period. Um, there were two probably key policy initiatives or possible potential initiatives that um, occurred over the quarter. The first Will touched on briefly, which um, was the Federal Reserve in the US now stating that they'll be tar targeting an average inflation rate of 2% rather than a hard target of 2%. So what that means is that um, the Fed seems to be happy to see inflation run above 2% for a period of time. Now we know we're a long way below that at the moment, but it does suggest that if or when we do get to that level, they're going to be happy to see it run, run a fair bit higher for a while to ensure that we really do have some inflation in, entrenched back in the system. Um, the bond market didn't like that announcement at all. It sold off quite heavily, about 20 basis points, um, uh, you know, on the, on the basis of these higher inflation expectations that initially came back into the market. But eventually it calmed down again as, you know, the market realised, uh, notwithstanding all the money that's been pumped into the system should eventually lead to some inflation. We're still in a deep recession and um, rates are gonna stay very low for quite a long period of time yet, at least until the end of next year, we think. Um, and so on that basis, yield just gradually drifted back to where, roughly where they'd been at the, uh, at the start of the quarter. Um, the second policy initiative is here in Australia and it hasn't actually occurred yet, but the RBA has been hinting pretty strongly that it will, and that's a further cut in interest rates. Um, there's a pretty strong expectation now that interest rates, uh, both the cash rate and the three-year target rate will be cut by 15 basis points um, next month from 0.25, where they are right now, down to 0.1%. So, so that would be quite a significant move, and the bond market here has started to adjust for that. The shorter dated bond yields have rallied about 10 basis points, so they're about halfway between that 0.25 and 0.1% now. Um, the other thing the RBA has hinted at is that they will start to buy bonds in the five to 10 year part of the curve, which they haven't done before and suggests they may start targeting the yield curve further out than they have previously. So that, that is quite significant also. Um, 
it suggests that they're determined to keep um, borrowing costs down for corporates and, and others for quite a long period of time to really try and get this um, recovery un underway. Um, so both those things are, are quite significant to go to influence the bond market over the next uh, six to 12 months especially. Um, with respect to credit spreads, um, not that much movement uh, over the quarter. They're, they're still relatively tight. We still feel reasonably comfortable with credit, but we do stress that you have to be very careful about the names of the bonds that you're invested in. You know, the recession impacts really haven't been deeply felt yet, and there will no doubt be some corporate bond issuers who come under under stress. So we ensure that our, our managers are avoiding those are avoiding those bonds. So, so what does that mean overall for us with respect to bonds? Well, overall, we're actually a little bit underweight at the moment. Um, although we don't see much risk of bond yields going up over the next three to six months, the yields are just so low at the moment that the risk reward we don't think is um, really justifies um, being too long bonds in your portfolio right now. So we're tending to be um, holding shorter dated bonds and more floating, floating rated bonds. And as I say, we're a little bit underweight from a tactical perspective. Uh, with the currency, still very hard very to predict. Hard. Um, that's the reality of it at, at the moment. Um, if anything, the currency over the last quarter was probably behaving more um, in tune with what the US dollar was doing. So if the US dollar was weak, the Aussie dollar was strong and, and vice versa. Um, yes, commodity prices are providing some support and interest rate differentials are providing some support. And look, our medium term view is that the Aussie dollar will drift higher from these levels eventually as the recovery continues and commodity prices we think will stay under, underpinned. But in, in the near term, there's just too much uncertainty with respect to the election in particular, um, you know, potential further COVID outbreaks in the Northern Hemisphere and so on. So we believe the prudent thing to do is keep our um, current position of 50% hedged for the time being. Uh, and that's basically it. So back to you, Kay. Oh, sorry, I think Will's going to talk now oh. on equity. So over to you, Will. Over to you, Will. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, look, the S&P 500 in the United States have tested new highs during the quarter. Um, uh, 21st of August is when it, it peaked and the MSCI World Index, it's climbed more than 50% since its March lows. So equities have benefited from these record level lows of interest rates. Um, and there is a perception and rightly so that they're gonna remain lower for longer. The one thing which is really important is we think is this is a very strong advocation towards conviction style management. This has been exacerbated over the last six months with a really strong disparity between winners and losers. So there's three points on this. And the first that stands out and brings us to this difference, you know, Main Street versus Wall Street theme. And winners have existed in the areas of technology, healthcare, logistics, and some areas like retail, travel, property sectors, they've generally been the underperformers. Um, the second point is also the, um, the geographic dispersion in return. So Australia's rolling 12 month performance is nine, negative 9.35% of the 30th of September. And only the UK is performed worse at negative 16.51, whereas the S&P 500 was up 15.14% over the same 12 month period. Now, Australia's actually been making up some ground in the last uh, few days. Um, that's on the back of the budget. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a very stimulatory budget in New Guinea, and we'll talk about that um, shortly. But one of the reasons why it did lag, and I think it's gonna to continue to lag um, relative to global markets. It's large underweight to technology and it's overweight to banks. So we put that chart, which many of you have seen um, previously in our insights. Uh, we put that again in the last insight where we reweight Australia based on MSCI world weightings. And when you are reweighting upwards sectors such as um, technology, healthcare, infrastructure, industrials, these are all areas that um, perform very, very well, but have a smaller weighting in the Australian index compared to the global index. So you're up ticking them, whereas you are downsizing things like energy materials being resources, um, you, even banks where um, even though it's on a market PE, um, you were downsizing that 
it's blown out. So it's normal range, um, as you will see on that, has been about a 12% premium. It was at a 15% premium, so 25% premium um, at the beginning of this year, and we cautioned against that. Um, and when the correction occurred in March, it came down to about a 15% premium. It's blown out to a 55% premium. But as I just said, you've got to look at the reasons why. Um, if you look at it, the, that chart also, what it's illustrating, um, Bo, on a, on a straight out MSCI world index level is now at a 10% discount um, to MSCI world index near the bottom, it's 15 year range. That's Australia versus that without reweighting. Um, but I think you've got to be able to compare apples with apples, not apples with watermelons. And I think that's really, really important. And in hindsight, when you've got IT at 2.4 times its global valuation, healthcare at 2.2 times, industrials at two times, utilities at 1.6 times, these sectors appear very expensive to their global peers. And that's why you're now seeing a 55% premium. The third and final thing, and that is style has been crucial. Um, growth has dramatically outperformed value. Um, look, it may reverse. I don't believe in the, you know, if it does, it's going to be short term only. Um, and I think that's another reason why you know, you need to, um, and you, you put all these three things together and you need to, act, we advocate strongly towards truly active management of equities and a bias definitely towards offshore relative to Australia. Kane's just going to touch on property. Thanks, Will. So property, much like uh, Will spoken on equities, it's been very much a story of uh, sectors. So specialist sectors such as healthcare, and industrial logistics, they continue to outperform uh, more traditional sectors such as retail and core office. Uh, residential housing has surprised many pundits with most states, uh, the exception being Victoria, now seeing price declines tapering off and market activity has started to rebound. Limited net migration is a concern from a demand point of view. However, targeted government stimulus has been effective in bringing forward future demand and supporting monetary policy alongside a banking system which continues to extend repayment lifelines. These will all work to support the property market over the short term. Uh, the listed A rate market continues to show value on a relative basis to both equities and bonds. So the real yield on offer um, over bonds now sits at over 6%. The sector is also marginally cheap on a historical basis when looking at listed valuations compared to their book values, with the market price to book value sitting at just under one compared to its long-term average of 1.2. Direct government support and mandatory tenant relief policies are limiting the number of forced sellers in the market, although this is an area of focus going forward as support measures will eventually start to wind back over the following quarters. Uh, so on that note, I'll hand back to Will to talk on alternative assets. Yeah, look, um... These asset classes, and because alternative assets are many different asset classes, they've reduced volatility and enhanced returns in our portfolios. Kane actually did a lot of work starting about two years ago, looking at dedicated buckets, so to speak, for all the various sectors. So sub-asset classes, I think is probably the best way to describe them, like distress, sorry, diversified credit, et cetera, private equity. And that was a lot of hard work in that. It's interesting to see there's a debate now whether a traditional 60-40 portfolio is appropriate, and a lot of other people are doing the work we did two years ago. Um, and what it's done is in doing this is we've come through the last, especially the last 12 months, it's ensured client allocations for each sub asset class are appropriate rather than just having this one asset alternative asset bucket. And they've contributed to portfolio returns and they've dampened volatility um, and therefore reduced portfolio risk. We believe this is where the best risk adjusted returns may exist in the short term. And we're positioning portfolio weightings over the next quarter or two, especially in the areas of private equity, diversified credit, distressed assets, um, and even direct property. And we think that there are opportunities that have arisen, will continue to arise, and they will produce superior long-term returns. Another thing you know, we're going to look at again, for instance, is water. It's raining a lot. That's a good time to look at water. Um, Investors must, however, understand the liquidity of most of these assets. It's important to diversify within each asset class with a vintage style approach to investing. In other words, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And it's got to be appropriate. This is not appropriate for everybody that's listening on this call. 
Um, so that that's the most important thing to ensure that you know, this is right for you and your risk profile. On Tuesday evening, the federal government brought down the 20. 21 of the federal budget. I'm going to hand over now to Ian Gillies to provide his observations on what is a really important thing for us every year. Thanks, Will. Well, we finally have Australia's great suppression budget uh, handed down by the Treasurer on Tuesday night. Uh, their key focus is on driving Australia's economic recovery and provide significant support measures for both households and also businesses. Broadly, a mix of previously budgeted items have been brought forward for example, the personal income tax changes, and some new items have been added to generate economic growth. The government's looked at it and really they have three main ways to create economic growth. That's increase the number of people working, and increase the amount of time that people are working for, and increase the productivity of the work. In this instance, they've looked at trying to keep the number of people working increasing, or at least not reducing and the amount of time is going to be somewhat more difficult in the, the first phase, but we haven't really looked at the productivity element in recent times, unfortunately. So broadly the government's looked at business spending and investment and the tax incentives to boost take home pay and employment for younger Australians through JobMaker. There was an understandable, although notable absence of policies targeting foreign migration uh, clearly, with borders closed, as population growth is at best forecast to be flat over the short to medium term. Some of the key proposed measures that the government has included in the budget includes bringing forward of the legislative increase of two of the marginal rates in the 19 and 32 and a half percent income tax brackets from July 22 when they were initially due to come in and bringing them forward to July just past. That still needs to be legislated for, and it provides, in a maximum sense, around two and a half thousand dollars in tax savings. This means that for employees and also employers, there's going to be a revisitation of salary sacrifice arrangements for both remuneration packages and for superannuation salary sacrifice. Allowing businesses to expense capital investment and carry back losses is another measure that has been brought in and that is going to be to offset previous year's profits. Whilst the expensing increase and carry back losses provide good optics, it's really only worth at most 30% of the expenditure that is going to be used to offset. It's great for those with existing capex plans or scheduled capex, which is able to, again to be brought forward. Um, there has also been extension of the COVID-19 related support measures, including JobKeeper, JobSeeker, and importantly, the new JobMaker hiring tax credit to support businesses hiring new staff. The JobMaker qualifying criteria is that the new employee needs to be employed after the 7th of October this year and have received specified Centrelink benefits in the last three months for at least one of those months and aged between 16 and 35. The payment is $200 a week if aged 16 to 29 inclusive and $100 a week if aged 30 to 35. Now, whilst we are yet to see all of the detail for the implementation of this program, on face value, it requires some substantial rigour around it, particularly how a new job is to be defined for the payment to be received. Now, at the moment, it just says to increase overall headcount. So for some employers, I'm expecting we will see attempts to replace existing employees with employees who meet the job maker criteria. An employer, for example, could replace one current employer, employee, I should say, with two part-time or casual employees working the minimum of 200, uh, two, 20 hours a week, sorry, potentially securing the $200 a week bonus. Um, the maximum would be 10,400 each additional job. And in this particular instance, it would only be paid to one of the jobs because there's only been one increased headcount. It will also be detrimental, I expect, to workers over 35 who just don't have this kind of support or subsidization available to them presently, and who I expect will languish in some instances in either un or underemployment for an extended period. 
Employers are also going to get a 50% wage subsidy available for new apprentices. This is capped at 100,000 places between the 5th of October this year and the end of September next. And that'll be for new apprentices or trainees for 50% of their wage up to a maximum of 7,000 per quarter. We've also seen some reforms to superannuation to reduce duplicate accounts and improve transparency and performance. Starting from the 1st of July next year, we'll see stapled super. And that effectively means that the super is going to be stapled to the member and it will follow them from job to job. That will save the government believes uh, significant money in terms of administration costs for the members in administration of multiple superannuation funds that they may get as they change jobs. In a lot of cases, I don't expect that will really be the case, but there will certainly be savings on policy charges rather than administration fees that are attached to these funds. Um, my super products also are going to be subject to a comparison tool and a performance test, which is going to be quite interesting. If the my super product fails a performance test, it will preclude that particular fund from accepting any new contributions. So I expect that we'll seek consolidations in and exits from the my super products accordingly. There have also been some significant spending measures to support and improve the aged care sector. For example, uh, capital gains tax exemption on granny flats and that type of thing. Uh, we have also seen an expansion of the government's first home loan deposit scheme. So there'll be an extra 10,000 buyers who will be able to avail themselves of that. And that will allow them to buy borrow up to five on up to 5% deposit and avoid the lender's mortgage insurance. Also, the government has been sensible in this instance that they've increased the values that first home loan, uh, first home buyers can purchase up to. So it's now 950,000 in Sydney, 850,000 in Melbourne and 650,000 in Brisbane. There are a number of other measures that were introduced, um, some applicable to our clients, their parents, and perhaps their children. Um, rather than going through them all now, if you'd like to discuss any particular items, please let us know and we'd be happy to help. Over to Will, thank you. Look, just before we open up for questions and there is the Q&A button down the bottom, I just want to just very briefly summarize and you know, asset allocation, I'm, I'm a bit like a, a scratch record in this point, but it's been really important. It's, it's minimized the impact of the current crisis. It's also helped you on the upside um, and it's going to be an even more vital factor going forward. We're going to see more centrist and protectionist policies um, as a, in economies as they, they take hold. Um, look, no one knows what's going to happen. Um, and that's why we're taking such a prudent approach to asset allocation, you know, with our tactical allocations, as, as um, Kane rightly told you, um, around our strategic asset allocation. But it's important to have a conservative strategy built around this asset allocation. Stick to your process. And I also understand that the levels of government stimulus we're seeing are going to have a medium term effect. But at the same time, as I just talked when, by highlighting, uh, especially the level of debt to GDP that you're seeing in the US, this debt burden is going to have an effect on economies for generations to come. So thank you for that part. And I'm going to open up if you've got any questions, we're very, very happy to answer them. I might start with one, Will. I don't think any have come through yet. You spoke about the diversified credit bucket. Can you elaborate on you know, what that is actually included in that bucket? Sure. So we have corporate credit in there. Um, and so that's, you know, as many people know, our office is next door to Coles. So it's names like that. So it's not government debt. It's, it's the credit of corporate corporates. Uh, the other thing is uh, we also, from a lot of these portfolios, we have first tier mortgages in there, but, but pooled. We don't look at single asset risk. We very much are looking at uh, pooled risk in those. Um, so it's a combination of, you know, predominantly between, between those two things. But we've also taken into account opportunistically, for instance, Oak Tree um, came out with a distress credit opportunity. Um, and we felt that that was very worthwhile. So it's, it, it's, it, this is not um, government bonds. I think that's, that's a different asset allocation and it's got a different risk profile. And uh, yeah, by going into hybrids and, and 
corporate credit, for instance, as a substitute for government bonds, we think is very dangerous. We don't seem to have any open questions. So if there aren't any, I'm going to wrap it up there. And thank you all very much for your participation. Um, this is the second webinar we've done in a week. So we know that this has been demanding on you, but uh, there's a great rollout. So thank you. Uh, we look forward, we'll be holding, we will be holding another in conversation with, um, with HWP in January, just after Christmas, but there are quite a few um, webinars in the run up to Christmas. Um, it's terrible talking about Christmas in October, um, but we will be ending them in November. So there won't be any in uh, December. And as I just mentioned, only one in January. So thank you for participating and have a great evening.